Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for this opportunity uh, to address the students <coughs> of the National Law University. Law is actually uh, the peaceful way to fight a war, uh, which uh, instead of using weapons. And therefore, it's something to be proud of. If you become uh, lawyers in this in this country, on today's topic, my uh, thesis is that the Indian state, which is embodied in the Constitution, its making and interpretation is has the ambience of what we call as Hindutva. People say that the Constitution lays down the question of the, that we shall be a secular state. <coughs> the problem with that is the definition of secular. If uh, this definition of secular is that uh, the state shall not have a religion. That is, you don't have to belong to a particular religion to occupy high executive office or constitutional positions, which was the original concept when Martin Luther propounded the theory that the church should be independent of the government. If that is so, no Hindu kingdom in the entire civilization of India, or civilization of history, has ever required that. Of course, for most periods, uh, we had 100% Hindu population. But still, it is only the Buddhists and subsequently the Islamic, Islamic uh, uh, kingdoms which required the you to be of that religion. There was no formal statement as far as any of the Hindu kingdoms that you have to belong to the Hindu religion. Because the concept of Hindu religion was in based on what is called as diversity of thought. Hindu religion does not have a prophet. Hindu religion doesn't have a book. Hindu religion doesn't have a church or a Makkah. <coughs> Hindu religion is not of one theology. It has a variety of theologies with a common basis, definitely. There is a common basis. And the basis includes that you can achieve God in this life, which other religions do not accept. They say only after you die you can meet God. But in Hindu religion you can meet God in this life, provided you follow the discipline. Similarly, Hindu religion is the only religion which says all religions lead to God. It doesn't say all religions are equal. But it says that all religions lead to God. I can come to your national law university by metro. <coughs> I can come by car, I can come by bullock cart. Uh, there are various ways, they are all, uh, the road is charted, so I reach here. But it is done by different methods. The same way, Hindu religion believes that there are many paths to God, but all of them do lead to God. So therefore, the concept of secularism has been built into Hindu religion. I have to give you this background because some of these terms are used so loosely that I have to make clear within what definition I'm speaking. In this country, there have been minorities who have come to seek refuge. The first came the Parsis, the Zoroastrians. Islam took over Iran. There was persecution. They came to India. We received them, we built their fire temples, 
They became former society and they are today indistinguishable for the rest of the society. The Jews came after persecution worldwide. They came to India. The Hindus built the synagogues for them in Kochi, Bombay. And when Israel was created, most of the Jews left for Israel. But the Israeli parliament passed a resolution saying, thank you, India. You are the only country where the Jews were not persecuted. Even Islam originally came through the Arabs in, in uh, Kerala. And then they settled down here they, and they married Hindu women. And that was called, therefore, they were called Mapilai. Mapilai means uh, son in law. So there was no history of animosity, although there have been, there have been, there were attempts to restore Hinduism to its uh, predominant position when Buddhism had spread through the, uh, through the work of the Shankaracharya, the Adi Shankara. But that was done by discussion. The Hindus have a tradition called Shastra, which means you have a discussion. If you lose the discussion, you convert to my point of view. If I lose the discussion, I convert to your point of view or your religion. And the Shankaracharya started from Kerala and all the way to Kashmir, and he converted people back to Hinduism. And then he modified the Buddhist concept to such an extent that Mahayana Buddhism, which came out of Hinayana, became almost indistinguishable from Buddhism. And today, we regard Buddha as a tenth avatar or an avatar of Vishnu. <coughs> so this, uh, all these religions that we have in India are, except for Christianity and Islam, were born in India and we regard them as reform movements. Although they are separate religions, Sikhism is a separate religion, uh, so is Buddhism, Jainism, but uh, we do not uh, treat them differently. We consider them as part of the overall Hindu fraternity. Now, what is this Hindutva? It has been demonized so much that people are afraid to say, I believe in Hindutva. It's actually a code of ethics, it's not religion. Hindutva translated into English means Hindu-ness, the quality of being a Hindu. And that is a code of ethics. Relationship between father and son, father and daughter, mother and son, mother and daughter, husband and wife, father and grandfather. These relationships, which you can see <coughs> on this question, is Hindutva. It is the Hinduness. You will not find this kind of relationship in the West, for example. Similarly, <coughs> Hindutva means to place the value, the highest value to sacrifice. When I first went as a student to Harvard, I had to get my PhD to begin with. Later on, I became a professor there. My classmate asked me, can you explain to me why Indian people accepted Mahatma Gandhi as their leader? So I said, well, I'm a bit uh, puzzled by your question. Could you explain why you are asking me this question? He said, because Mahatma Gandhi was not properly dressed. How can you accept a leader who is not properly dressed? Yes, it's a fact that Mahatma Gandhi just had a piece of lion cloth. And he walked around, and that's why Churchill used to call him a half-naked fakir. So I asked him, in your country, does the leader have to be very well dressed? He said, yes, he must have the best suit, the best tie, the best coat, his shoes should be shiny. <coughs> In fact, he gave me the example that there was a debate between John Kennedy and Nixon, and Nixon lost because he forgot to shave. 
something which uh, in India you would not think twice. Similarly, the religious leaders also are very well dressed. They take the Pope, you will never see him in anything but satin gown with, uh, with uh, uh, diamond, ruby, sapphire necklaces. His cap, their foot will be full of studded with jewels. Whereas you see our sadhus, our spiritual leaders, they have just had a Baba Kapra to surround them, even if they are very well placed materially. Ram Dev, for example, you can see him, he's a yoga guru. He goes even to the Buckingham Palace half naked. And there is uh, you know, something that he will do. We venerate such people. So the highest uh, form of, of your, the highest position in society you occupy when you gave up everything. This is something peculiar to Hindu. Now, <clears throat> that is why in 1996, Volume 1, SCC 169, the Supreme Court said that uh, Hindu Hindutva is not a religious term. <coughs> It represents a social order. It represents a code of ethics. And it was nothing wrong in saying for then the person who had come and appeal, because the Bombay High Court had found him guilty of making a communal speech when he said, that is Manoj Joshi. He had made a speech saying that Sir Sena BJP is going to win the elections, and the first Hindu state will come into being in uh, Maharashtra. So somebody went and filed this as appeal to religion. The Bombay High Court found him guilty. And he came and appealed to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, uh, you know, uh, set aside the Bombay judgment and said that merely to say that a Hindu state is not an appeal to religious uh, for votes for religious purposes. It is a opinion that you are expressing as to what would happen. And therefore, Hindu is a way of life, it's not a religion. There are many theologies in, embedded in it and so on. The, the, the first uh, authoritative statement based on an analysis of the Constitution, he said that an Indian state is the same thing as a Hindu state. Now, when the constitutional constitution was being debated and finally it was created, we find that every institution had a motto. And uh, each of these mottos are from our uh, Vedas, Upanishads, and so on. And they adorn these institutions when you see them. <laughs> Court Parliament, it says, Aham Nija, Paraveti, Ganana Lagu Chetasam, Udara Chalitanam, Vasudeva Kutubaka. That is, don't be small minded that this is mine and this is yours. Regard the whole world as yours. This is written as you enter the Central Hall of Parliament in Parliament. You go and see behind the Speaker of Lok Sabha, Dharma Chakra. Pravartana, which means the cycle of dharma moves on. There are ups and downs, but it moves on. In Supreme Court, the slogan written on the wall is Yato Dharma Tato Jaya. In the government of India, Satyamev Jayate. Because there is no Satyamev Jayate in practice, but, uh, <laughs> but indeed, that is the slogan. <coughs> in Durdarshan, Satyam Shivam Sundaram. In Delhi University, Nishta Riti Satyam. These are slogans which have been given and no one has objected to it. These objections have come afterwards, after Sri Jawaharlal Nehru uh, became the Prime Minister, all in all, and uh, consequently, these things 
the Indian state began <coughs> to develop a new concept of secularism, and that is nothing to do with religion. Breaking coconuts? No, not allowed. Lighting lamp? No, not allowed. A kind of uh, anesthesia uh, film or, uh, or a sterilized form of secularism. Now, uh, let's look at the governance of the Indian state. And here, I'd like to refer to the Constitution. Can the Indian state interfere in the affairs of religion? Most people think in a secular state, the state has no role to play in religion. Not correct. Read Article 25. And let me read it for you. It's a quite, a, quite something. Article 25 is a fundamental right. Freedom of conscience and free profession, practice and propagation of religion. <coughs> what it says? Subject to public order, morality and health, and to other provisions of this part of fundamental rights, all persons are equally entitled to freedom of conscience and the right to freely profess, practice and propagate religion. Now what does it say? Subject to public order, morality, and health. In other words, I can, I can interfere in religious affairs if I felt it was against morality, if I felt it was causing public disorder, or it was not conducive to health. Supposing somebody says that I believe in human sacrifice. Can the state interfere? Of course it can. Why? Because it, uh, it, uh, it affects the health of the person who is being sacrificed. He will be no more. <laughs> Similarly, if you say, my health requires that I should, uh, my, my religion requires that I should regularly beat my wife. Can the state intervene? Of course. It's a morality question. So, the state has the power to interfere in the religious affairs of any religion if any of these three things are violated. Let no one think that, you know, we cannot intervene in the many of the common concepts that we accept. For example, gender equality. The Supreme Court was in 1977 asked, do I have a right to convert? Because the Christian missionaries had come in big way, and they were in, come from abroad, well armed with a lot of money, and they started converting people to Christianity in a number of states. So this matter went to the Supreme Court. A constitutional bench sat over it. Called the Stanislaw Judgment of 1977. And what does it say? You have a right to profess religion, but you do not have a right to convert if it violates public order, morality, or health. <coughs> and therefore, if you induce somebody to convert, for instance, you say, You become a Christian, I'll get you a scholarship to America. You cannot. It's against the law. And many states have enacted statutes to say that if you do it, it's a criminal offense. Orissa, Madhya Pradesh, Himachal, a number of states which have done it. And therefore, when you are asking this question, religion and the Indian state, it is not saffron way where when you say that Hindus the separate way the Hindus say, all religions lead to God, there's no need to convert. You want to be a Hindu? No ceremony. Just say, I'm Hindu, tomorrow you're a Hindu. That is the Hindu way. And the constitution supports that. If somebody says that, no problem. But if you induce that person to convert, which the missionaries were doing, then it is against the constitution. You don't have a constitutional right. 
So this is the first part. At the same time, it says, sub Article 26, subject to public order, morality, and health, every religious denomination or any section thereof shall have the right to establish and maintain institutions for religious and charitable purposes, manage their own affairs and matters of religion, own and acquire and remove property, and administer the property such according to law. Now, does that mean that uh, if I start a temple, I can do what I like with the money that people donate? No. It has to be managed. If I have a mosque or a wakaf board or a personal law board and I collect money, can I use it as I deem fit without the state asking me questions? No. <coughs> Same thing goes with the church. So the power for a government to take over a religious institution which has been mismanaging its administrative affairs <coughs> is provided for in the Constitution. And since 1952, and even before when the British were there, there was a similar law in a different form to the form of a statute because we didn't have a constitution then. Temples were being taken over. And to, as of today, 4,57,000 temples are administratively uh, controlled by the government. Now, how can you call this secular activity? Because you are only controlling the secular activity of the temple. You are not interfering in the religious activities of a temple. So there was once an occasion when uh, uh, suddenly the Tirupati temple, which is the richest temple, taken over in 1933. That uh, uh, temple, the, they had adopted, they had brought in a provision to adopt a board of governors for the temple's administrative control. And they decided that they would gold plate Tirupati. The, all the pujaris came to me and said, could you please challenge this? I tried to speak to the board, they, they wouldn't listen. They said, none of your business. So I went to court to say that the board has only right to check whether the Tirupati finance is being properly you know, accounted for and so on, and uh, properly spent. But it has no right to say what the temple should look like, whether it should have gold plating or silver plating or no plating. And the Andhra Pradesh I quote, my position. Similarly, if there is no business management, then again the government cannot take over. So there is a very famous temple in Tamil Nadu called uh, Nataraj Temple, sometimes called Sri Sabha uh, Nayaka Temple. That temple was taken over by Karnanidhi's government. Karnanidhi doesn't like Hinduism, so he, he wants to take over all temples, then acquire all the jewels in that uh, temple, and distribute all the land in that temple. He made a practice and nobody had the nerve to challenge him. So they, the Pujaris came to me, so I went to court and argued the same thing. Where is the mismanagement? And I argued one more. Once you take over, Article 31 of the Constitution requires that after some time you have to return it back. And the Supreme Court upheld this argument of mine, set aside the order for the takeover of the temple, and then asked me, what do you consider as a reasonable period? I said, three years. And the court has still to finalize on that. 
But if tomorrow the government, if the Supreme Court says three years is the limit to which a government can take over a temple, then 4 lakh 57,000 whatever temples will come free. Now who's going to manage them? Tirupati was taken over in 1933, we don't know who to return it to. In the case of Savarayagana temple, it was easy because the Pujaris were there, it was taken away from them, so they got it back. So there is a big problem there, but uh, anyway, many people say, why government takes over only temples and not religious places of Muslims and Christians? Well, somebody who did go to the Supreme Court saying that this is Article 14 discrimination, equality before the law. The Supreme Court said, where have we stopped you from taking over the, uh, 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 the uh, religious places of Islam and religious places of Christianity? <clears throat> By the way, many people think that a masjid is a religious place. Let me disabuse you of that. I had the occasion to meet one of my old colleagues, our old students from Harvard, who is one of the members of the royal family of Saudi Arabia. And I found from newspapers that they were demolishing mosques and building roads and apartments. So I asked him, can you tell me, can you do this? I mean, the Muslims say, Saudi Arabia object. He said, no, it's just a building. Masjid is a place to facilitate reading namaz. You can read namaz anywhere, including in an aeroplane, including in your drawing room. It is not a religious place. Now, most people don't know that. It's about a Babri Masjid. They say, oh, religious place has been demolished. Well, the only thing you can say about Babur Masjid was it was an unauthorized de destruction. But you can't say you destroyed a religious place because in Islam, Masjid is not a religious place. And therefore, you are talking about me walking the saffron way. Very soon, one of these days, we are going to tell the Muslim community that see in Vrindavan, in Mathura rather, there was a Krishna temple, you demolished it and built a masjid. And in Ayodhya, you demolished a temple and built a masjid. And same thing in Kashi Vishana. These are three <coughs> premier places. Of course, you, over the years of 800 years, you demolished about 37,000 temples according to our records, maybe more, but not less. We're not talking about that, but these three, please build your masjid somewhere else. We'll build it for you. And leave these temples for us. Now, question was raised, whether under the Indian constitution, the Indian state, a temple is a religious place. That also you can say is a is a building to house the Lord. Well, when I was law minister in 1991, <coughs> a matter came up of an uh, of auction of a Nataraj temple. Uh, excuse me, auction of a Nataraj statue. That great dancing, uh, the Tandav of Shiva. And uh, the uh, uh, our high commissioner felt that it should uh, go back to India. So, how do we bring it back? Because the people who are going to auction it, uh, they said that uh, they found uh, a farmer having it and they paid him money and uh, brought it here. So, it's their property now. The farmer said, well, I was digging one day. I mean, I was running the plow one day and I heard a metal uh, sound. So, I dug up and I found this Natas uh, statue there. And it was, it obviously had come from a disused temple nearby. So, uh, therefore, uh, I sold it because I couldn't keep it. Now, we argued 
the government of India argued in the House of Lords that a temple is built after a puja which is called Prana Pratishta Puja. That you can only do after 41 days of fasting. Not like Mr. Kejriwal's <coughs> fasting, but genuine fasting. After 41 days of fasting, you recite certain prayers, and then what happens, according to our faith, the Lord enters the murti, the, the, the idol. And after that, the, the God whose temple it is, the temple becomes his property, and we cannot be its owners. We can only be its uh, trustee. So a temple is always a temple. Once the prana pratishta puja is done, not these uh, temples you see on the on the on the pavement. You see, those are all money making exercises. There's no prana pratishta puja and all this. It's a very uh, hard puja. So therefore, if there is a temple, even if there is no worship there, it is disused. It shall remain a temple forever. Who says this? The House of Lords judgment of 1991. So therefore a temple is always a temple. But a masjid is just a building. It can be broken to build somewhere else. So now which way am I going? Is it pure saffron way? Is it legal saffron way? So, uh, I, I would like to bring this to your notice. Now, let's look at some more constitutional provisions. Let's go to Article 37 of the Constitution. Article 37 of the Constitution says, yeah, it's under Part 4, Directive Principles of State Policy. The provisions contained in this part shall not be enforceable in any court. So it's not a fundamental right in that sense. But the principles laid therein, uh, principles laid, uh, therein laid down are nevertheless fundamental to the governance of the Indian state of the country. And it shall be the duty of the state to apply these principles to making laws. Now, what does it say? Let's take Article 44 of the of the Director of Principles. Uniform civil court for all citizens. The state shall endeavor to secure this for the citizens a uniform civil court throughout the territory of India. Now, this is a director principle. And the Article 3177 says uh, that uh, this part shall not be, this shall, will not be enforceable, but the principles laid down are nevertheless fundamental to the governance of the Indian state. So, what is the status of the Uniform <coughs> Civil Court? That it is a principle of governance, and therefore it should be implemented. People say that is not fair because. Islam has its own independent marriage laws and so on, we can't interfere. And we'll be against Sharia. Well, if that is so, then how is it that this country has uniform criminal court? We don't have Sharia for punishment for Islam, yeah, I mean of Muslims. We have one court for Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, everybody. And that is called the IPC. And uh, why not in civil court? Uniform civil court. And it's part of the constitution. Is it the saffron way? Well, people have given us the, the, the credit to the saffronites <laughs> that, uh, uh, that uh, uniform civil court is a demand of the saffron minded people. All right, now look at Article 370. Another contentious uh, uh, article. Article 370 says, what does it say? Temporary provisions with respect to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. 
notwithstanding anything in this constitution. It's the only uh, uh, article of the constitution that says temporary provision. All the others are permanent provisions. And then it goes on saying, <clears throat> notwithstanding anything in the foregoing provisions of this article, the president may, by public notification, declare that this article shall cease to be operative or cease to be operative only with such exceptions and modifications and from such date that he may specify. All constitutional articles can be changed, amended by parliament, by two-thirds majority. But as far as Article 370, it says, the president may, by public notification, say that the article shall cease to exist. So Article 370, which is considered as a saffron way, is already shown to be a temporary provision, which can be removed by just the president, Mr. Pranam Mukherjee, saying, Khatam ho gaya, and that's the end. That's in the Constitution. Then let's take Article 256, which very few people know about. <coughs> yes, time factor, 10 minutes. Uh, 256. It says uh, that um, 256, not 246. 246 is also very important, but I'm not on it. Obligation of the states and the union. The executive power of every state shall be exercised to ensure compliance with the laws made by parliament. And any existing law which, which applied in that state and the executive power of the union shall extend to giving such directions to a state <coughs> as may appear to the government of India to be necessary for that purpose. They hear the word state is used in the sense of a province. What it says is something which is there from ancient times in India. That we have complete decentralization in India. But in times of emergency, we come under what is called a single Chakravarti. And the whole country participates. For example, Mahabharata was a fight between two families. But when the war took place, all the kings from all over India came to take sides. In fact, in the tribal court king whom, uh, whose uh, descendants I know, they told me that they also took an army there and then found that two brothers are fighting, two families are fighting, so the king said, I want to, I won't take sides in this war, but I'll cook for both sides. So he cooked food for both sides, both the warring camps. And what this says today is that the center has a right to give a direction to the state, better do this. When these riots were taking place in Muzaffar Nagar, I told uh, that time the Congress was ruling. I said that give a direction to uh, to Akhilesh Yadav that the following things you have to do. Today I am asking that center should give directions to Jayalalitha because she's doing all kinds of crazy things, including filing defamation cases against me. <laughs> Look at this power. I am not talking about 356. 356 you can dismiss a government. A state government can be dismissed and the center can take over the administration for a period of 12 months, <coughs> six months at a time. This is what makes this Indian constitution not at all federal. It makes it unitary, which is the saffron concept from day one. India is a unitary state with subsidiary federal principles. It's a not, and if you read the preamble, it doesn't say India is a federation of states, like the United States. It says India is a union of states. 
We are therefore in one single country where the center is ultimately the prevailing power in all emergencies. <coughs> I think the best uh, essay I have ever read on this question of the saffron way of the Indian state, without being religious, by the way, there is nothing religious about all this. This is all law and order, governance. There is no place where it says the Hindu religion shall be the religion of all the people of this country or, or whoever occupies any constitutional position. These are social legislation. These are legislation for orderly society. And that is the saffron way. For the best uh, uh, essay I have read on this subject, <coughs> which I recommend to you all. And with that, I'll conclude my initial presentation. You can have all the questions you want to ask. Is by Justice Aftab Alam. In 2009, volume 10, SCC, not in the form of a judgment, it's an essay which prefaces the judgments. And therefore, on page J60, these are pages which come from Aftar Alam, 2009 10 SCC, where he is not writing as if he is happy, he is complaining. He is saying that progressively now we are realizing that the Indian constitution is in fact going the saffron way. I have no, no problem with this conclusion, but uh, I know that he is not happy about it. And he's explaining what should be done to stop it. But he was a great judge. I have appeared before him. I think very highly of him. He's retired now. But it was one of the finest essays I've read. I urge you all to read it. Thank you very much. <coughs>